This video series presents church leaders with growth strategies given by Jesus to the ancient church to stir up love and good deeds, foster oneness and community, strengthen the church, and increase holiness. This session explores an ancient church worship strategy to stir up love and good deeds and is presented by Stephen Ackerson, president of the New Testament Reformation Fellowship. Did you know? that in worship services of the early church, there was the freedom to speak, even if you weren't a pastor. There was an open format for sharing, for testimonies. There was the free exercise of those spiritual gifts that involve speaking. You see, spirit-led verbal contributions by the congregation to the meeting were the norm rather than the exception. The expectation is that you would come prepared that each one has something to share. There was an open, spirit-led participation by the many. Now, along with that, there was considerable spontaneity. It was an orderly spontaneity. There was fluidity. Nothing was predestined in a bulletin. It did not have to be scheduled in advance. There were general guidelines, but the proceedings were determined by the Holy Spirit. So there was freedom to speak, there was orderly spontaneity, and the goal for everything, said or done, was edification. That is, to strengthen the church, to encourage the saints as love and good deeds were stirred up. So in general, in early church worship services, there was a principle of participation. Now the question is, why did they do it this way? And maybe more importantly, what are we missing if we don't do it that way? So let's go back to why they did it the way they did it. This was a growth strategy designed by Jesus himself. It was designed to unleash the laity, to strengthen the church. It was designed to allow the free use of spiritual gifts in a church meeting. This would result in the encouragement of the saints. Its purpose was to stir up love and good deeds. And let me say, the churches I've worked with for 30 years have been practicing this. They say nothing ever becomes real until it is experienced. Well. We've lived this out, and I can testify that it really does accomplish these growth objectives. More importantly, it was directly commanded by the Lord Jesus that we do church this way. In 1 Corinthians 14.37, Paul said, The things I am writing to you, he was talking about these participatory meetings, the things that I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. So we'll come back and look at that a little later. So again, what was this strategy? The strategy from Jesus to the ancient church was that when they had worship, it was to be with an open format, orderly spontaneity, and the goal was to strengthen the church by stirring up love and good deeds. This principle of participation is what we're going to look at today. Modern church meetings are called worship services, and they're a lot like the old-timey full-service gas station. It used to be, in the 1950s, if you built into a gas station, someone would come out, they would check the air pressure in your tires, they would check the oil level in your car, they would pump the gas for you. It's called a full-service gas station. And so too today, when Christians attend modern-day worship services. It's just that. It's a service. You go and enjoy the show. People really like that. But it, to me, compared to a New Testament church meeting, that's a little bit like having a guitar with only one string. Well, it's a blessing to have a guitar with one string as opposed to no guitar at all, but it would be better to have a guitar with all the strings present. So there was more to a New Testament church meeting than simply worship. So again, a modern day worship service is a lot like going to a theater where you 
passively watch what's happening up on the screen or on the stage. Well, it's a lot like going to a sporting event. You're allowed to cheer, but you would never get down on the field and actually play the game. So a modern day worship service, well, let's become a spectator sport. That's what it amounts to. Your contribution, the typical church member's contribution to that church meeting is about like one more gallon of water going over Niagara Falls. Well, it wasn't that way in the early church. They didn't have worship services where everything was done for you. There was instead this principle of participation. There was the focus on the many rather than a focus on just a few. Well, before we look more at why they did that, let me just prove to you that that is really the case. The first proof comes from a scholarly testimony. Ernest Scott, a church historian, said the exercise of the spiritual gifts was thus the characteristic element in the primitive worship. Room was allowed in the service for the participation of all who were present. Every member was expected to contribute something of his own to the common worship. Theologian John Drain said, in the earliest days, worship was spontaneous. This seems to have been regarded as the ideal. But when Paul describes how a church meeting should proceed, he depicts a spirit-led participation by many. Anyone had the freedom to participate in such worship. G.W. Kirby of the London Bible College said, there appears to have been considerable fluidity with time given for spontaneous participation. The Scottish commentator William Barclay said, the really notable thing about an early church service must have been that almost everyone came feeling that he had both the privilege and obligation of contributing something to it. So obviously today we let people contribute money, we let them sing. But these scholars are indicating that there was far more than that that people could do in an early church meeting. There was this principle of participation. The second proof comes from first century synagogue practice. The earliest Christians were all Jewish. They had come out of the synagogue system to form new churches. So we shouldn't be surprised if there was some overlap between the way early church meetings were conducted and the way synagogue meetings were conducted. We go to the book of Acts for this. For example, the scripture says that on the Sabbath day, the apostles went into the synagogue and sat down. They're traveling throughout the Roman Empire for the purpose of evangelism. They're complete strangers to these people. They go and they sit down. And after the reading of the Law and the Prophets, it says in Acts 13, verse 14 through 15, the synagogue officials sent to them, saying, Brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. So here's an example where the apostles, unknown to these people in the synagogue, were invited to speak. Seems to have been somewhat of an open format. But this is not just a one-off situ situation. In Iconium, it says the apostles entered the synagogue and they spoke in such a manner that a great multitude believed. Same thing in Thessalonica. He said there was a synagogue. According to Paul's custom, this is what he did everywhere. This is how he evangelized. For three Sabbaths, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. You see, if the synagogues operated the way most modern churches do, Paul never could have evangelized that way. He never would have had the opportunity to speak. But because these early synagogues in the first century had an open format, Paul was able to speak. Same situation in Berea. The apostles went into the synagogue. It says they received the word with great gladness. Same thing in Athens. Paul was reasoning in the synagogue. Same way in Corinth. It says every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue. Same thing in Ephesus. Acts says Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there. So a principle of participation. So when the early Christians, who are mostly Jews, started churches, it shouldn't surprise us if there was the same principle of participation. Well, the third proof is drawn from the letter to the Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and following, it says, 
let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, but encouraging one another. What's the context? Church meetings. He says, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together. So this is what he's talking about. So we can learn from this. What was true of the early church when they assembled? Well, he starts by saying, he's not writing to pastors here. He's writing to normal Christians, ordinary Christians. Before you come to church, you need to consider something. Now, to consider means to think about carefully, to give thought to. What should you consider? How to do something. How to do what? How to stimulate the other people there to love and good deeds, how to encourage the other people there. So before you came to church, you were to think about how you're going to do this, how you would contribute to the meeting by stimulating other people to love and good deeds. Now, to stimulate means to excite to activity or to growth. The ESV says to stir up. Many churches have a coffee bar. You can go and get coffee. And there's stir sticks to stir in your cream and sugar. So I might ask, when you go to church, are you a stir stick? Are you to the church what that stir stick is to the coffee? Do you stir up love and good deeds? Is there an opportunity for you to stir up love and good deeds? So you see, when we format our church meetings, if we're going to do it the way is modeled in the New Testament, there should be some kind of a format that allows people to stir one another up to love and good deeds. It can't just be passive like watching a movie on television. He also says we're consider how we should encourage one another to stir up and to encourage. Well, who's doing this stimulating? Who's doing this encouraging? Well, the operative word there is uh, us. Let us consider how we can do this to one another. He's not singling out pastors. Of course, pastors do a lot of that. But everybody is deputized to do that. So we see that the focus was not exclusively on leaders. It was about each member doing his part as led by the Spirit. This is because all the members of Christ's body bear responsibility to encourage one another. And so worship must be formatted in such a way as to allow ample opportunity for mutual one another encouragement. So he begins in Hebrews 10, 24, says, let us consider how to do that. So, for example, you might ask yourself, who is discouraged that you might encourage? Who needs to be prayed with? Who can you purpose to fellowship with? Who should you take an interest in, a new person? a quiet person, an introverted person? Who can you get to know better that you don't know well? Is there a testimony you could share with the whole congregation? Can you bring a new song to the church? What did God do in your life this past week that you could report? What did God show you this week in your time alone with Him? How could you use your gift of exhortation to exhort the church? Maybe you have a word of wisdom you could declare. Can your gift of discernment be helpfully used? Has God given you a word of knowledge? Scripture says if any man is gifts as teaching, let him teach. Do you have an encouraging word? See, you see this principle of participation, things you should think about before you ever leave home to head for church. The fourth proof is drawn from the book of Acts. Luke records in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, Upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them. You might remember that was the time he preached all night. It looks like the mother of all sermons. But what's interesting is the Greek word beneath preached is dialogamai. That is where we get our word transliterated, dialogue. Now, a dialogue is a back-and-forth conversation. And even in the Greek, if you look up in the lexicon, it says it means to consider and discuss. Could even mean argue. So that we see, even when the Apostle Paul 
was speaking to a church, it was not like a sermon broadcast on radio. It was a dialogue. It was, to that extent, participatory. And so the ESV translates it that Paul talked with them, a principle of participation. Now, the fifth proof, and the most extensive, comes from Paul's letter to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 11.14 is an extended passage on church meetings. That's the subject. And as regards worship services, the, a pivotal verse is found in chapter 14, verse 26. What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. The ESV Study Bible says, These verses give a fascinating glimpse into the kinds of activities that took place when the early church gathered as the body of Christ to worship the Lord. What we see here is a principle of participation. He starts off again in verse 26 by writing, What then, brothers? It does not say, what then, pastors? You'd think it would. It doesn't. But pastors are important. They are essential personnel. In Thera's lexicon, in the definition of an overseer, he said it's one charged with the duty of seeing that things to be done are done rightly. It's interesting. In this extended passage on church meetings, chapter 11, 12, 13, 14, pastors are never once mentioned. And that seems to be because the focus is on the congregation as a whole, not simply on the leadership. But that said, pastors are very important. At the very least, they're the coaches on the sidelines that are being sure the plays are carried out correctly. And they can participate also along with the rest of the church. So it is very important that we have pastors who see that things are done rightly. But the focus, the spotlight, is on the church as a whole. So the, one of the jobs of a pastor is to make sure the church meeting follows the guidelines that are laid down in 1 Corinthians 11, 12, 13, and 14. So going back to 1426, he says, he writes, when you come together. What's the context? Well, I've already said it. Church meetings. So this is what church should be like. He's telling you. In 1423, he talks about when the whole church comes together. So back to verse 26. What's true of those times? Each one has. That should be characteristic of a church meeting. Each one. Who's each one? Each one of the pastors? No. Each one of the brothers. A principle of participation. Now suppose we crossed out the words each one. Let's take that out and we'll put in only one. Which option would be more representative of a modern church meeting? Each one or only one? Well, you know the answer. If your church is characterized mostly by only one speaking instead of each one speaking, then you're out of sync with a New Testament example. Now next in our verse, we go to what could be called the prime directive. He says, let all things be done for building up. The NAS says for edification. The NIV says for strengthening. Proverbs 25.11 says, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in setting of silver. The key is that everything spoken be fitting. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up. There it is again. As fits the occasion, it's got to be fitting, that it may give grace to those who hear. So the opportunity to speak in a church meeting doesn't mean that you necessarily should speak. It must be edifying. It must be fitting. It must give grace to those who hear. And that's where elders come in. They help people understand. They coach people so they know what's fitting 
and what's not. So back to 1426, when he says each one has, he is explicitly in this passage talking about the use of spiritual gifts, in particular those spiritual gifts that are verbal, that are spoken. So he says in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7, that to each believer is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. In chapter 13, the famous love chapter, he again applies that to spiritual gifts. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men, but I don't have love, I'm a noisy gong. If I have prophecy, but have not love, he says, I'm nothing. So love should motivate everything that's said in a participatory meeting. 1 Corinthians 14, 1, Paul started by saying, pursue love. And following that, earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. Romans 12 also lists various spiritual gifts, beginning in verse 6. He says, having gifts given to us, do what? Let us use them. A church meeting is a pretty good place to use them. He mentions prophecy, service, teaching, exhortation, generosity, mercy. All these are to be operative in a church and in a church meeting. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, Peter wrote, As each has received a gift, I'm talking about a spiritual gift, use it. How? To serve one another. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. So a participatory meeting is not an amateur hour. You're not up there to show off. When you speak in such a meeting, you need to believe that the Holy Spirit wants you up there speaking. There needs to be a certain amount of weight or decorum to that uh, as if you were speaking the oracles of God so that it would glorify Jesus and build up the church. Elders help people understand what type of comments do and do not fulfill that objective. 1 Corinthians 14, 12, Paul says, try to excel in the gifts that build up the church. So you've got this idea of edification, strengthening, building up over and over and over throughout Scripture. That is the prime directive. And so when he says each one has, he's talking about how to use your spoken spiritual gift in a church meeting. Well, the first gift he deals with in this short list that we've got is music. Each one has a hymn. Who has a hymn? Each one of the brothers gifted in music has a hymn. That's the context. The Greek word for hymn is psalmos, and it means a song of praise, quite simply. But there's also a one another aspect even to the music among those of us who aren't so gifted musically. It says in Ephesians 5.19 that the whole church should be speaking to one another. How? In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. This is similar to what is written in Colossians 3.16. Teaching and admonishing one another how? With psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to the Lord. So we see that even though in Corinthians he's dealing with people who are gifted in music, equipping, edifying the church through that, there's also a one another aspect to the music. And so what we see here is some degree of spontaneity. It doesn't have to be like professional musicians in an orchestra performing. Of course, excellence is always good. But it's not a show. The other side of that is, uh, Psalm 95, verse 2 says, Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. So there's this balance between a professional performance and a joyful noise. God, of course, looks at the heart. What's the prime directive? It's got to be edifying. All things must be done for building up. This is, again, where pastors are needed. 
What builds up one church in music might not build up another. Types of music vary from culture to culture, time to time. Elders should have a finger on the pulse of what's best for their church. Also, the words need to be true. It's not going to build people up if the theology expressed in the song is contrary to Scripture. I might even suggest in a modern setting that sometimes the music is too loud. If the music is amplified by the musicians so loudly that the congregation can't hear itself singing, it's too loud. That tends to squelch the one another aspect of it. So the musicians are to encourage the whole church singing, not squelch it by being too loud. So again, it's not a performance. It's a place for people to get up and sing a new song unto the Lord. That's fine, but it shouldn't fundamentally be like going to a concert. There should be this principle of participation. Now the next spiritual gift mentioned in the ESV is called the lesson. He says each one has a lesson. Again, each one is who? Each one of the brothers. You would expect it says pastors, but it doesn't. Each one of the brothers can bring a lesson, a principle of participation. But he's talking about the brothers who have the gift of teaching. Those are the ones who are free to bring a lesson. Brothers with the gift of teaching, Obviously, you want a brother who's mature in the Lord, sound in his theology. He's in good standing with the church. And again, that's where the elders come in. He's probably going to have to have the approval of leadership. But the point is, the pastors shouldn't have a headlock to be the only ones who ever teach. It is a major duty of pastors to teach. They probably are going to do most of it. But the scripture clearly expects that any brother with the gift of teaching would also be free to bring a lesson. And that's why James says that not many of the brothers should become teachers because there will be a stricter judgment. Point is, there was the opportunity for any of the brothers to bring a teaching who had the gift of teaching. So when we talk about participatory meetings and orderly spontaneity, I'm not trying to suggest that teaching is just haphazardly thrown in there. Teaching is very important. It should be an integral part of every church meeting. It says in Acts 2.42 that the early church was devoted to the apostles' teaching. Well, does that describe your church? Are you devoted to the teaching of Scripture? This is important. 2 Timothy 4.1 I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by His appearing in His kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. So when we're talking about a degree of spontaneity, well, teaching is probably not one of those places you can be that spontaneous. A quality lesson, as it says here in the ESV, requires prior preparation to prevent poor performance. It requires serious study, hours of study, and prayer it requires thoughtful reflection ahead of time and personal application. So in that sense, the lesson should probably be scheduled in advance. But the point is, it should be open to brothers with the gift of teaching, even if they're not pastors. What's the prime directive? Well, all things must be done for building up the church. The lesson must be edifying. Sometimes, people without the gift of teaching, without the ability of teaching, when they speak and it goes on too long, it's not very edifying. So that's the point here. It's also going to be true to be edifying. There's got to be application for it to be edifying. But we're, what we are looking at is this overall principle of participation. Now next, he deals with what we consider the more charismatic gifts of the Spirit, he talks about each one has a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Now, everybody didn't have the same spiritual gift. He's talking about those in the congregation who had these gifts who were free to use them. We're looking at spontaneity. It's hard to schedule a revelation in advance. It's hard to schedule a prophecy in advance. Spontaneity. And that's what I want you to see. And what's the prime directive? It's got to build up the church. Now, he's about to give rules to be sure it does build up the church. I'm not going to 
teach this deeply. My purpose is not to teach this passage, but I want to pull out this idea that it was spontaneous and it had to build up the church. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 27, if any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or at most three. You see the spontaneous nature? He starts off, if, maybe so, maybe not. We don't know if somebody's going to gift that gift. Two, one, two, at the most three. He does put a cap on it. And then he says, each in turn. So one of the rules he lays down is one person speaks at a time. So that's what the orderly part of the spontaneity is. A cap on tongues, if there are any, and one person at a time. The point is, multiple people participated. There was, obviously, a fair degree of spontaneity. He says later in this passage, verse 40, that all things should be done decently and in order. That's why we need pastors. Pastors are important. They are charged with the duty of seeing that the things to be done are done rightly. Paul goes on to write in 1 Corinthians 14, 27 and 28, that someone must interpret. Why is that important? He says, one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God, for no one understands him. That's in verses 2 and 3. Unless someone interprets, so that the church may be built up. So interpreted tongues build up the church. Not interpreted tongues do not build up the church, and they are out of bounds. What's the prime directive? The church has got to be built up. What I want you to see is a principle of participation. And next he deals with the gift of prophecy. I'm not going to deal with what that is or isn't. That's not my purpose. But he says, let two or three prophets speak. Again, he seems to put a cap on it. They're not scheduled in advance. Could be nobody speaks in a prophecy. And then he says the others must weigh what is said. So it's got to be judged. And then he says, if a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. Well, notice the if. You don't know if this is going to happen or not. Do you see the spontaneity that's going on? It's a fair degree of it. He says you can all prophesy one by one. Back to that order, one person speaks at a time. Pastors are important. They are charged with the duty to be sure that the things done are done rightly. And look at the effects of prophecy. Speaking about the prime directive, it's got to build up. Paul says, you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn. Okay, so one effect of prophecy is learning. Then he says, and all be encouraged. So another effect of prophecy is encouragement. And then he says, in verses 3 and 4 earlier, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who prophesies builds up the church. So, and another effect of prophecy is upbuilding and consolation. It accomplishes the prime directive through a principle of participation. Now, next in our passage, he deals with the role of the women in the church. Very controversial. I'm not going to deal with that either. I'm going to read it. It says in verse 33, As in all the congregations of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches. Now, whatever this means, it would not be necessary to write it to First Baptist Church of anywhere because in most traditional churches, nobody speaks. They have muted the women. They have muted the men. So it's not necessary. But what I want you to see from this is no matter what Paul meant, there was a principle of participation. Even though he's limiting the women in some way, that means the men were still free to speak. And there was the potential that the women were doing something, whatever that was, he didn't want them to do. You see a principle of participation. Now, in chapter 14, he is regulating spiritual gifts. There are other things that went on in church meetings. For example, Acts 2.42, they were devoted to prayer. That's a good thing to do in a church meeting. 1 Timothy 4.13, Paul says, uh, devote, be devoted to the public reading of Scripture. That's a good thing to do in a church meeting. Acts chapter 14 tells us that the mission team 
returned, and when they got to Antioch, they gathered the church together, and they reported all that God had done through them. Missionary reports. It's another good thing to do in a church meeting. What I want you to see is this principle of participation. And what's the point? Well, the point is to ask, how does this compare to your church meetings? You should be thinking that. Because what's the alternative? The alternative, too often, is that everything is predestined in advance. It is typed up in a bulletin. There's no question about what's going to happen. And like in this sample here, the only one who speaks, it looks like, is going to be Pastor Kelly. Well, that doesn't seem to be in keeping with a principle of participation. Now, if you go to a military cemetery, you will see perfect order. And what pastors fear in a church meeting like this is that there will be disorder. They want order. That's why they want a bulletin. I understand that. Well, the problem with the cemetery example is even though there's perfect order, there's no life. It's better to risk a little disorder and have life than to have perfect order and no life. And so for centuries, we have conditioned God's people to be pew potatoes. They sit there, you sit down, you shut up, you be quiet. You don't say anything. They're not used to speaking. And so it's hard to get them to speak. Often when they do, they need to be coached as to what is edifying and what is not. Well, Gordon Fee rightly pointed out, he said, the history of the church points to the fact that in worship, we do not greatly trust the diversity of the body. Edification must always be the rule, and that carries with it orderliness. But it is no great credit to the historical church that in opting for order, it also opted for a silencing of the ministry of the many. But going back to 1 Corinthians, Paul then raises two questions. Now he's writing to the Corinthian church. He asks them, was it from you that the word of God came? Did they produce the scriptures? Well, no, obviously not. They, they knew that before he asked it. And then he says, are you the only ones it has reached? Are they the only church that had a copy of the New Testament? And the answer again was no. So why is he asking that? Well, the point of it is to say, stay in line. You, the church in Corinth, have no authority to deviate from this pattern of participatory meetings with orderly spontaneity, with a goal of edification. You have no authority to deviate from that. Stay in line. I would ask the same thing to you. Did the Word of God originate with your church? Are you the only church that has a copy of it? Do we, as modern Christians, have the authority to deviate from this example that's given to us in the Scriptures? A lot of people think they do, that this is just interesting history, that description is not prescription, that that was just for the church in Corinth, that the principle of participation is optional. Well, if we keep reading, we're going to see it's uh, more than just optional. There's divine direction given. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 37. If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge the things I am writing to you are good suggestions. Oh, wait, it doesn't say that. The things I am writing to you are creative ideas. No, it doesn't say that either. Here's what it says. The things I am writing to you are just my opinion. That's just Paul's opinion. Oh, wait, it doesn't say that. The things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. And that really does say that. A command of the Lord. So I've got to ask again, how does this compare to your church meetings? Are you in compliance with a command of the Lord that we do this church, do church this way with an open format, with orderly spontaneity, and the goal being to strengthen the church? This principle of participation is what we see in Scripture. There's even a penalty for not doing it. Some people in Corinth didn't want to do church this way, just like sometimes we don't want to do it this way. But Paul writes in verse 38, he says, Now look, if anyone does not recognize this, 
he is not recognized. In other words, ignore anybody that tries to get you to go against this. That's what he's saying. A principle of participation is what he wants. So this is a strategy that Jesus gave the ancient church for conducting worship services. It is to be participatory, characterized by each one has and a one another emphasis. It is to be fitting and orderly. The main guideline he gives us is one at a time. And it is to encourage, to build up, to strengthen, to edify the church. Otherwise, it's not appropriate. And as we just saw, this is the Lord's command that we do it that way. What's the point? Well, the point is, what are we missing if we don't? If we don't allow the brethren the freedom to speak, if we don't have an, one another emphasis, if we don't have open spirit-led participation, if we don't allow spontaneity with some fluidity, what are we missing? Well, I think doing church in this way would help you avoid apathy, atrophy, and entropy in your church meetings. You will get the benefit of the many and not just the one. More input, more ideas, different experiences is going to lead to better and deeper insights into the movement of God and the way God works and the application of Scripture. So you're going to have a much richer contribution to the meetings on a regular basis. You're going to hear practical, heartfelt testimonies that are drawn from everyday struggles as normal, regular Christians try to apply God's Word to real-life situations. This is going to result in greater Christian growth by those who hear and are encouraged and can identify with that. It's also going to lead to more opportunities to raise up leaders within the church as they can speak what God has done in their lives. So this is a growth strategy that Jesus gave the ancient church to unleash the laity, in a sense there is no laity, to strengthen the whole congregation, to allow for the free use of spiritual gifts, the encouragement of the saints, to stir up love and good deeds, to help you obey what is a direct command of Jesus, and to lessen over-dependence on pastors. In fact, now pastors can enjoy the worship service as they are also ministered to and don't just have to be the only one who's building up the church. Now, today we've talked about why the early church did it that way. What I did not talk much about was how to do that, the practical aspects of that. You can find that at our website, ntrf.org. We have a book, New Testament Church Dynamics. We'll be happy to send to you. It has the what of the New Testament, the why of the New Testament in, as regards to worship, and how to do that today. This is drawn from 30 years of experience. Also, at ntrf.org, you will find MP3s. You can download that and listen to it while you drive on various other aspects of strategies that Jesus gave the early church. You will also find a workbook called The Practice of the Early Church to help you teach this, especially in small groups. It's laid out in Socratic format. And on YouTube, you will find pastoral tutorials about certain key strategies Jesus gave the ancient church. For instance, you'll find a size strategy for an effective ministry optimal size that a church should be. You'll find a leadership strategy, a management, pastoral strategy to lead like Jesus did. You'll see a communion strategy that will result in supernatural unity and community and fantastic fellowship. And you'll see a traditions strategy video that's designed to give us success in ministry. I'm Stephen Atkerson, New Testament Reformation Fellowship. Thanks for watching.